this workshop, um, which I'm which I'm just really grateful to be part of again. Um, I'm always very grateful for the for the invite. Um, you're probably feeling at this point that it's like two thirds content, one sixth bad jokes, one sixth old pop culture references, right? Um, I, I can't promise to get to Larry Curley and Mo um, that that Craig did. How's that? Is that good? Okay. Um, uh, I am really proud. Um, actually, I don't know if I should say this out loud. We, we slipped a Mean Girls quote past the editor in this book chapter that, that Jim mentioned. So uh, complete with citation. Um, I had to look up how do you cite a movie, right? So I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue from where Jim was, and, I'm, and that was a phenomenal introduction with only one factual uh, repeated statement I need to correct Jim on because we're not that old. The, 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 the early 90s references about modularity and quote unquote solving the number of clusters problems, that was actually only 2004. So we're not that old, Jim. We're old, but not, um, so, um, and yes, I've probably um, done the same thing. So my goal for this um, period is to sort of continue a couple different thoughts of uh, the material that Jim kicked off well um, with a real focus on this question about the resolution parameter and then introduce you to some much promised code if you've been, well, you've all been coming to these, or the vast majority of you have been coming to these in previous years, or if you've looked at the materials that are online. Um, this is sort of the latest update, finally getting to do some things in R that I've been promising for years that you would be able to do in R. It is not, and Jimmy's laughing at me, um, I am not a developer. Um, my son is a software engineer. He um, has not volunteered to help me with this. Um, he's great, but has not volunteered to do that. Um, but uh, we, are, we are finally going to have some of these things. They are not in IdeaNet yet. They will be, but um, in the Google Drive that you will have access to will be all the scripts that I will use, most of which you do not want to look at. I wrote three wrappers um, so you can start doing things. But, but my one giant, I have takeaways eventually that I will show you on the slides, but my biggest like highest level takeaway is do not hesitate to reach out to me to try to use some of these tools. That's what we're here for. That's what we want to see actually happen. So um, what I want to do is, even though, even though Jim gave a phenomenal introduction to community detection, I want to share my own sort of personal favorite uh, greatest hits of community detection because I, I think it adds to what he said about reasons why you might want to do this. And so this is old work that um, Mason Porter and I did that was uh, led by um, Mandy Trod, um, Vanessa Red, um, and this is, uh, this is a hairball, uh, well that you probably knew, this is a hairball representing what the Facebook friendship network looked like of Caltech users on a given day in early 2005. This is back in the very, very early days of Facebook where you needed a .edu address to do anything, and I've already suggestedly, uh, suggestively uh, colored and Lucky Charms symboled the nodes um, according to the houses that these uh, Caltech Facebook users were affiliated with. So um, I have no personal experience with Caltech. I don't know if anyone in the room does. Um, the short version or the urban myth version of it will be that the students all show up and it's some like crazy self-sorting into these houses um, these residential houses, and then they largely stay affiliated with the same residential house their whole four years there. And so, you know, this clumpiness that Jim talked about. Well, we're not surprised to see some clumpiness according to the colors here. Um, and if we run an algorithm through here, so we just, you know, take some, this might have even been leading eigenvector. Um, so we take, an alg we take an algorithm, we shove it on this data. This is the exact same picture or the exact same underlying data now with an additional layer of community assignments to each of the Facebook users in this graph into however many pie charts there are there. I think there's roughly 12. Um, and now the colors are still coding what house are they affiliated with. This was like just pure happenstance luck of running an algorithm at the default. This is pre-knowing um, about resolution parameters, and it just kind of worked, and we were able to tell a story. And um, that story, as you can see, is that for the most part, 
it seems like the, the houses are very well aligned with these communities that were identified algorithmically. So, so importantly here again, I need to emphasize that this house attribute on each Facebook user is not something that was used by the community assignment algorithm at all. The community assignment algorithm was purely this modularity maximization via a particular heuristic, uh, a la what Jim was talking about, and then we are comparing and contrasting that each one of the communities has some number of users who have that house attribute self-reported um, on their Facebook page. Um, there's a whole data privacy story that would be very entertaining to tell right here uh, relative to our ethics uh, discussion. Um, I don't know that I want to uh, uh, embarrass myself too much by going all the, all the way down that road. Um, we know far more about this data than we ever should have. Um, in a great moment of um, doing the obvious thing and having it work out, Eric Kelsick, who is the second author on some of these papers, decided to do the simple thing and just plot a histogram of the number of Facebook users at Caltech. He was a Caltech undergrad at the time, so he's sort of, you know, that, that insider knowledge is useful. Plot a histogram of how many Facebook users had reported being members of each of the houses in the data set that we had. And it needs to be stressed, Facebook did not tell us what, um, what the houses were here. They just gave us you know, purportedly anonymized um, numerical values for each of the houses. And they were just something bland like 185, 186, 187. So he plotted this histogram. And then while he was at it, he decided to go look in just sort of some Caltech fact book a, a histogram of the number of people who were affiliated with each house and the shapes of these two histograms were almost identical. Um, the, the, the one in the fact book was of course just listing the houses alphabetically. The histogram for the, um, for the, for that he had made, you know, of course had put 185 before 186, 187. He called up his Facebook contact. He just goes, it's just all alphabetical, isn't it? Yeah, so um, we're not supposed to know that these two houses are actually right next door to each other on one end of campus and are well known for having a lot of social interactions between them, but, but now we know that. We also weren't supposed to know um, the, the, at the time, binary gender uh, identifications in the data. They just, you know, there were ones and twos, and you know, is one male and two is female or the other way around? Who could possibly know? Well, if you give us the data to Wellesley College, it's not too hard. Um, so uh, yeah, so these two are really close to each other on one end of campus, that makes sense. Um, this little Pac-Man looking thing here is a, is a particular house that they were interested in. And um, so uh, it, seems like, it seems like pretty much all of the colors, at least in the very large communities, um, they make sense with, of course, the, the exception of one important color here that seems to be rather well distributed across the communities. Purple. What's the deal with the purple nodes? Well, the purple nodes are simply the people who didn't say on their Facebook page which house they were affiliated with. So, simplest data imputation problem ever solved. Um, if I'm throwing a party for Lloyd House here, which is the yellow, I think, I'm certainly inv inviting everybody in the purple wedge. Um, so you can do a lot of really basic things with community detection. And what I want to do here today is basically show you some slightly more advanced things that touch on um, the, some slightly more advanced tools that I want to encourage you to use that touch on some of the issues that Jim introduced. Um, there, there is an R Markdown file that I will walk us through because I don't dare like try to type in public, particularly with a taped up finger. Um, and it's uh, designed to talk about two algorithmic approaches that we're going to try to uh, introduce you to here. Um, I loved Jim's comment about like you just need to create a new community detection method. We aren't going to create a new method. These two methods instead are going to be post-processing methods to try to clean up the results that you get from all the other methods. So you'll see those um, in play. Throughout what I really want to be repeatedly emphasizing is you know, unlike that great dream that Jim talked about in the early days of the introduction of modularity where we thought this was solving the how many clusters problem, it doesn't. This is just another form of unsupervised clustering of data specific to a network's context. But like any unsupervised clustering of point cloud data, 
There are myriad ways that you could be doing this. There's no single right way. In fact, there are some beautiful no free lunch theorems that, that uh, ideas that Lido Peel and his collaborators have introduced. Um, you have different algorithms. The algorithms have different knobs on them. Uh, Chris Danforth at the University of Vermont, I always loved it uh, to, to quote him that he said, every good microscope needs at least one knob. So, so I'm going to kind of treat the resolution parameter as a feature, not a bug here. And then it's our knob on the microscope that's going to tell us some things. Um, what you actually want to do with these communities is, of course, up to you and your application. This is why I wanted to start with that Facebook example. Because right, the story of the Facebook example is not that we found clusters. It's that those clusters were telling us something specific about Caltech and that was different than other institute other universities and that then we could like leverage that information and, and tell a story about how the Facebook networks related to different schools and so it's just one tool you can use to then say hopefully interesting things about your data and the two post processors that we're going to use here that um, that are going to help us make a little bit of sense so the sweeps we're going to be doing this maybe needs to be really carefully clarified the sweeps that Jim showed you that were the best solutions to this um, which community uh, partition to pick problem that gave the, the best agreement with the ground truth, well, that was because we knew the ground truth so we could compare against it, right, and pick out the best one in a sweep. So that's not what we're going to be doing here when we sweep. What we're going to be doing instead um, is sort of all captured by this little cartoon. So what we're going to do is say you've got every one of these points is like you ran a community detection algorithm and came up with an answer, right? What does an answer mean? An answer means you have a set of labels of which nodes are in which community. Um, I happen to be drawing it in 2D for those who have asked um, smart questions so far at this workshop about multi-layer networks. It's because I'm already thinking in a world where I don't just have a resolution parameter, but I also have at least one inner layer coupling parameter, that, so I have two knobs on my microscope. But maybe your other knob is, is you know, something else. Um, we're going to be assuming that you know, in what we're going to show you today, there will only be one knob, but the cartoon um, already works here for two knobs. And so the game that we're going to play are two things. One of them we call CHAMP. We will tell you what CHAMP stands for in a little while. The other one sort of is lacking a good name, but it has a pretty picture. So, so what happens in CHAMP is we're going to take all the different partitions of nodes into communities that you might get over your parameter space running different algorithms. And then we're going to say, well, wait a minute. What you really wanted to do, if what I should say, if this is our assumption, what you really wanted to do was optimize modularity at some resolution parameter or in this picture add some resolution parameter and some inner layer coupling parameter, then we can take that whole set of partitions and it's a super easy post-processing uh, operation to work out which partition is optimal relative to the input set in what domain of your resolution param of your parameter space. Now as soon as we just have resolu resolution parameters, what you'll see is this will just be intervals. What interval of that gamma that Jim showed us is that the right answer? And so then once you have that, like you have a picture like this, you know, without knowing anything in terms of the labels, well, you might think, OK, I might ignore these smaller regions and go grab some of the bigger regions. These pictures tend to not be quite this uniform. And then we're going to play a second trick on you, which we're going to call iterative mapping in the parameter space. It needs a much better name. Um, it's also sometimes called modularity pruning. And what we're going to do is we're going to run a map on top of that and I'm going to explain all this to you in greater detail. I'm just kind of doing the telling you the big picture where this is going. We're going to run a map that's due to some work by Mark Newman and then some follow-on work um, from uh, Mason Porter's group that is going to take each one of these domains where one solution is the best and map it to a particular point in the parameter space. It's going to assign and say, that solution is best identified by this point in the parameter space. Well, in the cartoon here, what you can see is a whole bunch of different things like these purples and these blues. They map into the green, but the green maps into the yellow, and then the yellow maps into the blue, which finally maps to itself. So the blue is self-consistent under this mapping. 
that the point of the parameter space associated with that set of community labels is actually a place where it is the optimum modularity solution. And so we want to highlight that one for you and say, hey, maybe that one's kind of special. And if you go the other way, you see the same thing happens with the pink. And so these are just going to be tools for us that we'll then see work out here in practice um, when we go through the notebook. Seeing that really what the goal of all this post-processing is, is to take a whole bunch of different solutions. So you ran a whole bunch of different things. You got a bunch of marbles. I don't know which marble to pick up and how to start looking at it. I mean, Jim showed you some things we can do, comparing and contrasting which nodes are in which groups with each other, how many times. But what we really want to do is we want to say, how do I focus down on a smaller set of these solutions so that then maybe I can go do something meaningful with whatever my application is. Um, and then, again, the big promise finally of today, though full disclosure, it's been working for about six hours. So um, it might still be a little buggy. Yeah, I, I got it to work this morning. It was great. Um, uh, so I've uh, been working at it for a while, found one really big important bug this morning, so that's great. Um, so I'm pretty sure it works. Your mileage might vary. Do not hesitate to contact me. We want to get this working. If you happen to be a Python user, these two packages for CHAMP and for this iterative parameter mapping are far, far more robust than something I got working six hours ago. So um, feel free to use them, but also feel free to let us know how these things work in R. So again, going into all of this, if the simple thing works, do it. This is the typical thing that one might do, right? You load your data, happens to be the Zachary Karate Club. Everybody knows the story of Zachary's Karate Club? Yes, no, maybe? No, oh, it's gonna be fun. Okay, we'll share that with you in a second. Okay, so Zachary's Karate Club just happens to be one of the standard data sets that you can find in iGraph data. And then you pick your favorite cluster routine out of the many things that exist in iGraph and you run it. And it gives you a partition. So partition to me is the set of community labels. Every node has been put into a community. It's a hard partitioning. Here it happens to be grouping you into four groups. It tells you that the modularity, and when it says modularity here it means with gamma equals one, happens to be 0.44. It tells you who some of the groups are. It draws a pretty picture for you. If you're happy with that pretty picture and it matches with your story, you're done. You go home. You're very happy. Um, so that's great. Um, in fact, Zachary's Karate Club is so overused. So the great story on, on Zachary's Karate Club, and I'm really, really scared to tell this story in front of sociologists because they might actually know. But the, 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 as an applied mathematician, the, the urban myth version of, Net, of Zachary's Karate Club is that Zachary was surveying the friendship ties between a bunch of people in a university karate club. And then they got in a big fight with each other. I mean, yes, they get in a fight with each other every day they go to practice, but I mean, they got in, a, in an argument about the future of the club. The president of the club and the lead instructor had some total falling out over what they wanted to do next. And so then they broke off into two rival subclubs. Um, and you could, I mean, I guess I should have left the picture for a moment. The, the, idea, of the, the idea of the picture, which we'll come back to, is that um, so, so uh, the, the, one of these is the president and one of them is the lead instructor and they broke off into these two rival clubs and if you were one of these people trapped in this argument, which club are you gonna join? Well, if, you have a, if you have a dog in the fight, the repeated uses of the word fight here are kind of funny, but um, if, you, if you really cared about what the substance of the disagreement was, that might influence which club you join. If you don't care, you're gonna go to the club where all your friends are. And so sure enough, this thing fractured basically pretty much exactly right here. And these two subgroups went off and joined one group, one club. And these two jump, went off and joined the other club. Um, person nine is always the one that like an algorithm might get wrong by putting on the wrong side of this split. It sort of depends. Um, my colleague Mason Porter actually once, um, one of his students printed a 3D model uh, a force-directed layout 3D model of, of Zachary's Karate Club and sent it to him in the mail, and it fell apart. Sadly, it did not fall apart in the right place. Um, otherwise, that would have been great. But um, so um, it snapped in two, but snapped in two somewhere else. And this is so overused in the network science community at this point that it is a little prize that has traveled the world now for eight years. 
Um, I think 20 some people have been the recipient of the Karate Club Club Prize for being the first person at, nobody, no, the, one of those people's not here, are you? Damn, one of these days I'm gonna win this. Um, if you're the first person at a conference to use the, the Karate Club in a substantive way in your talk, then you get inducted as the next person into the Karate Club Club. I have never been in it. Clara Grinnell, who was a postdoc working with me at, um, at one point, she received the prize. Um, I've lost track of who has it right now. It's possible Santo Fortunato has it. If he does, he owes me because I'm the one who pointed out to the organizers that he had used it in a talk last summer. Um, this is also so overused that, so this is just another force-directed layout of the same of the same network, um, that when we held in a long time ago now, 2010, 2011, we had a whole program year at the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Sciences Institute, SAMC, um, which used to be an NSF-funded math institute here in the Triangle, joint between Duke, NC State, and UNC Chapel Hill. We had a whole program year on complex networks and the statistics and applied mathematics of, the, of it. It was great. Eric Kalachik, um, who was then at BU and is now at, where is Eric now? He's at McGill? Is that, okay, nobody knows. All right, somebody has to know where Eric is. Um, uh, he, um, he was our organizer for the year. He did an absolutely phenomenal job. And he gave me the greatest quote that I've been able to use for a dozen years right now. He got so sick of seeing karate club pictures and particularly things about community detection and Karate Club that in a moment of peak, he said, if your method doesn't work on this network, then go home. Roughly five minutes later, Mason Porter had that available on a t-shirt for sale on the internet. I think if you go digging, um, you can still find it. The idea is, is that you know, this happens to be um, a, a partition of nodes into communities um, along the dashed lines into the four communities like we saw in the previous graphic, and the Dark and light nodes are the who went to which club. Um, you know, it works because, again, it just matches up to this story or that if you didn't have um, a, 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 a real burning desire to go with the one club or the other based on the substance of the disagreement, you probably went to the club with your friends. Um, so keep this in mind that sometimes these things work brilliantly. But that all said, as much as there's sort of that story worked real well, um, there's a couple things that we want to put out as caveats here for you to, to try to take, take away today. One of them is, is that modularity is problematic. Um, it's, it, it's problematic in many ways. It's, it's a purely descriptive object, objective function that you're trying to optimize. Um, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, you want, might like to have a really good generative model and that you could fit to your data, but as Jim showed, a lot of the existing stochastic block model methods, how well do they work on different data sets? You know, your mileage will really vary. Um, modularity is just a descriptive measure. It doesn't, the, the value that you get out, that modularity equals 0.44 or 0.88 by itself might not necessarily mean anything. Um, nevertheless, it is a, it is, I think, undoubtedly the most widely used method overall, and, and the reason is because it has a lot of different heuristics for maximizing modularity that are easily available to many users. And so it remains, I think, undoubtedly the most used method of community detection. That all said, it is really frequently misused. Um, as Jim was saying, you know, in the earliest days, we didn't even know that there should be a notion of a gamma there. And so if you are using any modularity-based clustering algorithm, or I use these words interchangeably, clustering, groups, communities, community detection, they're all the same things to me. Um, if you're using an algorithm to group your nodes into communities and you didn't pick a resolution parameter, well, you did, right? You picked whatever the default was. And the default might just be one for modularity maximization, or it might be something that's completely nonsensical and nowhere near a meaningful solution. So, you know, it's, it's important to know that that resolution parameter is there, and if you're doing anything with multi-layer modularity, um, there's at least one more parameter that's controlling the coupling between the layers. That's a topic we will not go into in depth at all today because um, I don't have working R code for that. If you want multi-layer modularity, go look at those Python GitHubs that I mentioned. 
Um, it needs to also be emphasized that a lot of the different heuristics, so many of the uh, cluster algorithms that Jim was referencing, they have inherently pseudo-random um, effects in them somewhere. Often it's because of what order the nodes get, this, get selected for different, um, for different choices to be made. And so because of that pseudo-randomness, it leads to uh, stochastic results. You don't get the same result running it over, running it um, repeatedly, and, you know, unless, of course, you fix the random seed, then that's the whole point of fixing a random seed, as we will see. Um, and so this can give you a lot, these, these stochastic variability running the different heuristics means that you're going to generate a lot of possible solutions that then you need to compare against each other or you need to somehow filter out, and that's why we're going to filter them out. So our, our, whole met, our whole mission here is that if you're going to use modularity, we want to help you use it right, and that's why we developed CHAMP and this iterative parameter uh, space mapping. So Jim already went over this, but just the, the, the quickest high point again, um, just to fix some of my notations. So Q is the traditional letter used for modularity. It also uh, very nicely stands for quality. Um, you can get into a nitpicking semantic argument about whether or not modularity means gamma equals one, or do you mean the general, sen uh, the general set of modularity-like objective functions for the quality of a partition where they depend on gamma. I'm going to do the latter, use modularity and quality interchangeably here. Um, the, the notation I'm going to use is that sigma is going to denote one partition, so one set of community labels, and, um, and this is the same sum that Jim talked to you about before. AIJ is just my data. PIJ is some null model that in, for undirected networks is typically uh, the, degree, the, the node strengths, Ki and Kj, multiplied by, uh, by each other, divided by the total weight of edges in the network, um, double counted. Together, this is called the modularity matrix. It's useful to call it a matrix because that's where the eigenvector pieces come from. You're doing um, eigenvectors of that matrix if you're using a leading eigenvector method. And then again, that's that indicator where um, I'm now noting again within partition sigma, um, what's the community that node i has been assigned to, what's the community that node j has been assigned to. This is just zero or one if they're the same, or well, if they're different or if they're the same, respectively. Um, one very typical confusion I'll just inject here for you. Sometimes you will see, particularly from early uh, developments in the introduction of modularity, you will see it not written as a sum over node pairs, but instead a sum written over communities and the nodes that are within those communities. It's basically because of this indicator that those two formulations are identical, right? Again, this is only one if i and j have been placed in the same community. So you can very trivially drop the indicator and instead write this as node pairs i and j that are in the same community. And so those, um, those, that's just worth sort of pointing out to everybody. And again, the goal is to find a partition sigma of nodes into communities that maximizes Q for a given resolution parameter. And you know, again, I like to think of um, you know, the resolution parameter here is just my knob. If I tune it down and I tune it all the way down to zero, what happens? If I tune it all the way down to zero, this very hard and hard in a computational complexity sense, NP hard optimization problem becomes trivial. Because if there is no P, because I make gamma equal to zero, then all I need to do is pick the community labels that maximize the total weight of edges within the communities. So take any connected component, wrap your arms around it and call it a community. And that will be the answer. Um, as soon as you start making gamma larger, oops, go back. Um, as you make gamma larger and larger, what are you doing? You're increasing the cost that you pay for putting two nodes into a community together. The gain you get is if they're connected, this is a cost that you pay independent of whether or not they're connected. So at some point when you make gamma big enough, such that this term beats all of the, edge, all the possible edge weights, then what you'll find is that every node has broken off into being its own community. And so there's a whole sweep here from zero up to that value of gamma. You can keep going, right? You just keep getting the same answer, right? The same answer forever at that point. 
is each node is its own community. Um, so you can get a lot of answers by doing this. And so what we did in this paper a few years back is try to give you a way to post-process those answers in a meaningful way within this modularity context. And again, at, we're going to be completely agnostic from this point out in the theory, at least we're agnostic, about how you got your communities. We can take any set of partitions you want. We're just going to then post-process them, post them based on this notion of modularity. That said, in practice, what you will see in the R notebook is we will use one and only one func type of function to generate our communities, and you'll see why. Uh, so we developed this CHAMP method, the convex hull of admissible modularity partitions. Right? It's got a much better name, though, than iter iterative parameter space mapping, so I still need help with that. Um, and so here's the idea. And the idea is going to be demonstrated on one of my other favorite community detection sto uh, uh, network stories, which is college football. Um, Duke, maybe not the school to hang out and talk a lot about college football, but you know we're going to do it anyway. Um, so th the reason why I like college football as an example for community detection is that if you know anything about college football, you've probably heard words like the ACC, and really if you just know anything about college sports, you've heard words like ACC and the Big Ten and the SEC, the, the different conferences that Div 1 college sports um, are divided up into. And, and in particular, in college football, you play many, many more, many, many more games. Sorry, did I not, did I not uh, carefully represent my Pacific Coast friends? Um, they're over there. They're over there complaining about East Coast bias right now. Um, so uh, probably correctly. Um, and, and so um, right, you play many, many more games. Um, like, you know, USC always plays UCLA, right? Yes, okay, so <laughs> there we go. Um, you always play more games within your conference than you do outside your conference. And so this should be a very clustered network. And if you shove it in, I don't even remember what force directed layout this is. Every single node is a school. They're color coded here by their conference affiliation. This is only the, what were then called Div 1A schools. Um, in, uh, for the 2000 uh, football season, right? This is now the football bowl subdivision people. Um, I've lost track of who's where in this diagram. This should be really, e I have done nothing to doctor where the nodes are on here. I've just dropped it in a force directed layout. It should do a really good job of easily pulling out the conferences. And yet, when you go, when you go run and you're going to see some absurd numbers. Like we ran community detection using the Louvain algorithm 50,000 times. You do not need to run it 50,000 times. But it really actually doesn't take that long to run these things, actually, uh, uh, because the codes have gotten to be so good. Um, so we're going to run community detection 50,000 times using the Louvain algorithm. And we're going to do it over a whole bunch of different values of the resolution parameter running from 0 to 6. And we're going to plot for you here two things. The, the, the red is the value of this modularity, that is the quality, um, as a function of gamma. And the orange is how many communities did we get in that answer. Now, if I look at, I, and I don't find this picture very satisfying. Because, OK, um, what's happening? You, you get a very sort of clear envelope here in red, which is expected because um, it is well known, due to some work uh, by Aaron Clausette and, and others, that there are many nearly optimal uh, partitions, uh, nearly optimal local solutions to these kinds of community detection problems. And so the heuristic is not guaranteed to get you the global answer. Um, instead, right, it's, it's, it's a heuristic. It's getting something you hope is good. And in many cases, you see it got a value of Q that's, that's very close to the, the max it ever sees at any given value of gamma. So it seems to have sort of swept out um, a little envelope here. And yeah, in some cases, the values are, are, are well below. But you got to remember, there's 50,000 red dots here. So having you know, a handful of them below the curve is, is not a lot of times that it didn't work. More worrying to me looking at this picture, and again, this is supposed to be a really easy case. Looking at this picture, it's like, well, I have to squint you know, to sort of be like, OK, I mean, yeah, it's the number of communities. Read the number of communities from this side. Um, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 
eh, 12 communities for a little range here? Is it 11? Is it 12? Again, at different values, you get slight. In this range, I either get 11, 12, or 13, depending on you know, just what happened with the pseudo-random selection of the ordering of the nodes. Um, so this, you know, this is telling me it looks like there's ballpark 12 communities in here, but it's a, you know, many, many different answers. Um, although it's maybe not as bad as I'm saying it, as I note down here, in these 50,000 calls to the Louvain algorithm, you only actually get 384 unique answers. So, right, the, some, the same answer, that is, but the same set of community labels is appearing many times. But still, I would have thought we could do a lot better than this. Because if we can't do better than this on this network, how are we going to do anything on a network that's, that's more complicated than this? And luckily, this is where the post-processing comes in. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to leverage this upper envelope here of, um, of the red curve. But we're going to do it in a very um, particular way, which is we're going to say, whoops, oh, come back. Um, there we go. We're going to note. Right, we wrote down that formula for you, and made, we made a point of restating the formula. And the point is that while over here I'm plotting for you what happened at a selected value of gamma, and I'm plotting that value of Q that we got when we put that value of gamma into the algorithm and got out some communities and got out a Q, the formula for Q as a function of the community labels is actually just a line in gamma, right? It's a, it's a trivial rearrangement of terms here to pull out the gamma. There's this thing, which is the total weight of edges within the communities minus the total weight of the penalties that you pay for putting nodes in the communities. And so I'm just going to take this whole sum. It's just a number, right? It's just a scalar that comes out after I do that number. So I'm going to call it a hat for that partition sigma. I'm going to call this one p hat for that partition sigma. Again, because a few of you asked very smart multilayer uh, questions. When you do this for multilayer modularity, you just get a term that's all the couplings. So it's a C hat, if you like, and, and so it's still linear. So the point is, is that when, every time we found one of these answers over here, our 384 distinct unique answers, we didn't get a single point of Q versus gamma. We got a whole line of Q versus gamma. And so let's just plot all of the lines that we got from those 384 unique partitions that we found by running this 50,000 times. And if you plot all the lines, then you can pick off the line segments that make up the upper envelope of this curve. And, and this is the cool thing, that there are only 19 of those 384 answers that ever f land on this envelope at the top. You're like, where, where did the other 360 of them go? There are lines down here. It's sort of hard to pick one out. But I mean, there are lines underneath here that um, I think there's, a, there's at least one here. I mean, they're just all over the place. They, there's lines that are coming down, and they just sort of don't quite kiss the envelope. They always stay just underneath the envelope. Is there useful information in those other 360-some answers? Well, I mean, very likely there's, there's something useful in there. But if the whole point of finding communities this way was to do so in a way that maximized modularity, none of those 365, I can do the arithmetic, um, uh, none of those 365 answers are the optimum anywhere at any value of gamma, they're always beaten out by one of these other 19. So that's a huge win, right? If our goal here is to take the big, well, you know, the big bag of marbles and squeeze it down to a, a, a much smaller number for you to consider, well, we've, we've already gone from 384 down to only 19. But then when you look at the picture, my eye is immediately drawn that there's probably not even really 19 of them I care about here. What I am particularly drawn to, and this is admittedly a little bit of an art using the, using the picture, what I'm drawn to, um, and I guess I should have shown you the, the plot that goes with those 19, is that I see there's a really big range right here where there's one line segment that is the dominant over this large range of gamma. And then there's another smaller region. The, the triangles here are marking all the spots where two lines cross on the upper envelope. And so, yeah, I've only got 19 things on this upper envelope, but this one, this one looks really important to me in the sense that it's the answer for a very robust range of gamma. Think about it. 
Back in the days when we had analog radios in our cars, which is maybe a statement for like four of us in this room, um, right? I told you, see, like old pop culture references. Um, so, right, you know, you'd actually have to like tune the dial and you'd hear the signal come in and out. This is like a super strong signal coming as I, as I turn the dial, I keep getting the same station for a really long period of time. So I wanna listen to that station. Um, so there, that one seems really important. This one seems really important. Your eye might be drawn to this one up here, which might seem really important, except for that that's the community labels where you say everybody's in the same community together. So you didn't really learn anything by doing that one. Um, you know, if there's a community, if there's a set of community labels that is optimum for a little, little tiny sliver, sliver here, that's pretty suspect to me. Um, because, you know, this is also only based on the 50,000 calls that I did here. Maybe if I go run a bunch of other calls, I'll get slightly different structure of intersections in these spaces. But I'm pretty confident that this one's pretty robust. Nothing seems to be beating it. And this is just a replotting of that previous data, but now pointedly the, the, solid, uh, the solid line breaking out what was the number of communities for each of those. And so, right, this big region here corresponding to this line segment, that's a 12 community partition. It's a really good split of the, of the schools, of the college football teams up into their 12 communities. Um, you can also, now that you have this very reduced set of partitions to query, you can start looking at them and try to figure out what makes sense for your data. I mean, you might still be thinking, yeah, well, what about this one? Is this one important? It's a simple matter now because you only have two things to look at, to look under the hood at the community label assignments and find out that this 13 node partition we happen to find by this way is simply the same as this 12 one with one of the communities breaking up into two. It's a conference that's breaking up into its two divisions. So these, this is a tool to help you make sense of this plethora of solutions by guiding your focus to a much smaller number of them. Now while we were doing this though, there, an, another methodology was being developed um, that uh, really, really slick idea from Mark Newman, um, a sentence that probably has been uttered many times in many contexts. Um, so what he did in this great paper in 2016 that I will not talk about the math of this. Um, uh, other than to say, what he did is he realized that if he reorganized around the equations for doing inference on what is a, a degree corrected planted partition stochastic block model. So let's unpack that real fast, right? Degree corrected just means that his model is, um, is including the node degrees as an attribute um, influencing so that high degree nodes are more likely to get more edges. Planted partition just means it's the simplest version of the stochastic block model where you say nodes that are within the same community have the same additional propensity on top of their degrees to be connected to each other and it's the same for every single community. So there's just a, there's a, there's a parameter that is, uh, there's a parameter in here somewhere, I guess it's theta. Um, there's a parameter theta in that basically is that, pr that propensity for all pairs of nodes that share a community together. And then there's another parameter theta out that is just what's the propensity if two nodes are not in the same community. Full stochastic block models have many, many more parameters than just these. This is just planted partitions. And they're planted partitions for the reason that he saw that if he moved around the log likelihood of obtaining the data from a model with those propensities and those degree sequences that he could massage it all to look an awful lot like our modularity formula, only instead of gamma, he has this really funny ratio of the propensities and the, the differences of the propensities and the differences of their natural logs. Why? It just comes out that way. Um, and so the cool part is, is that what you can do with this is he was, and then he was able to say, well, okay, if, if this looks like modularity maximization at a particular value of gamma, what I could do is I could take a solution, a set of community labels that I get from running modularity maximization, and then I can actually just empirically measure from that partition what this theta in and theta out are, and that tells me what gamma that solution is, would have been the log likelihood inference solution at. 
And then he does a bunch of cool work with a bunch of cool networks. We already told you about the Karate Club. We've been telling you about the American College Football. Oh, yeah, we're even going to tell you about the political blogs here before the end. And so importantly, this is just taking a, tab a table right from his paper. He's here saying, well, a priori, if I know how many blocks I want to break these into, then I can simply find um, a uh, modularity-based community uh, partition that has that number of blocks and then I can figure out what gamma that should have been at and go until this is self-consistent and closes. And it does a really great job if you fix the number of blocks ahead of time. Um, so uh, this happens to be with cluster spin glass just because it was a way that we could say I only want to grab two community solutions. So this is that same karate club and I'm insisting I only break it into two communities. So I will put in an initial value of gamma. So here's a whole bunch of initial values between like 0.25 and 3. And the way to read this picture is what we did is, so let's start at the top here. We put in the initial value of where gamma was 3. We asked Cluster Spin Glass to give us a solution with two communities. It gave us a solution. And then we plugged that solution into Mark's formula for what gamma should it have been at. So, so there are, all the dots here are just on the y equals x line. And what we're doing is we're showing you a map of how we went from this initial value of gamma to the next value of gamma. So we started at 3. Mark's formula took that two community solution and said, and eh, no, you're supposed to be here at like whatever it is, 0.78, whatever it says over there. Um, and it turns out that no, really no matter what initial value we started at in this range, in, we got an answer. And in that one step, already, Mark's method said, well, no, the, the gamma that corresponds to the solution, they were all the same solution, um, should be 0.78. And so then you run it again at 0.78, you get the same answer, you're done. It's all converged and it's in a fixed point. Remember, the Karate Club. This is the Eric Kalakshik famous your method doesn't work on this, go home. Okay, well, what if we don't know how many communities we want to break our data into? And instead, we say, all right, I'm just going to let K be whatever comes out of running things. So we'll use the Louvain algorithm. And if we start at an initial value of 3, then it starts over here. And the first step, if, because it found many more than two communities, only steps over um, one little bit. And if you start at very small gammas, it only steps one other version over bit. And now it's, I'm really wondering about the colors of this picture that I showed you. Because um, I'm sort of missing, missing a bunch of colors off my slide. I apologize. Um, it's worse than just that they stopped in different places. It's that now you can start running this map. And so if you, um, if you start down here near the bottom and you get a two community solution, it's going to tell you as we saw over here, that the two community solution that it finds is associated with a gamma of 0.78. But then if you go run your code at 0.78, like 95% of the time, it's going to give you a three community solution. And about 5% of the time, it's going to stop and say it's happy there. But the other 95% of the time, it's going to keep going. And then it's going to tell you that that, point, that that three community solution has a gamma that's somewhere here just below one. And then most of the time, but not all the time, it's going to tell you that instead of stopping there, it's now a four community solution and it's going to keep moving. Um, and so what's missing from this figure, I apologize, but I'm trying to communicate in words, is that here I was with the arrows trying to show you where it went in one step and the blue where it ended. And where it ended here is just a god awful mess of randomness because sometimes it ended with two, sometimes it ended with three, sometimes it ended with four because Everything is being tricked here by that stochastic variability that you get because you're running a heuristic. And you don't actually know when, you, when you're at 0.78, what's the best answer at 0.78? Right? You just run Louvain once, it either tells you it's two communities or it tells you it's three communities. You're sort of, you're, you're, you're letting yourself just be run by the randomness here. Well, how are we going to clean up randomness? We just did that. Right? We had champ. So let's take, and again, this was the, you know, go home if this doesn't work. So here's the big idea with the iterative, the iterative, the, the iterative parameter map. We're going to run Newman's iterative scheme 
But we're not just going to run it and recompute communities every single time. We're going to run CHAMP. We're going to break everything up into these small number of communities, I mean, small number of partitions for us to consider. And we're only going to use those that we found that are anywhere on that upper envelope to run the iterative map. And that's just it. Now, is, it, is there still a little tiny randomness here? Yeah, way back at the beginning, how many runs do I do that I feed into CHAMP to begin with? There could be some variability back there. But once you've run your initial set of partitions, everything about this map now is deterministic. And it's a deterministic map with some nice properties on a finite, on a finite state parameter space because it's not all possible values of gamma, right? It's only the gammas that are associated with these intervals. And so you're all but guaranteed to end up with a fixed point here. And so let's just see how, how this works. Wow. Where? Okay, I don't know what's going on with the colors on this computer. <laughs> um, all right, well, in the PDF that you, will, that you have for download, um, there, are some, there are some beautiful extra gray arrows on these, on these figures that do not appear good. Is somebody, you're actually looking at it and you can see it, it's not just me, I'm not, okay, I'm not hallucinating the gray arrows. Okay, so in, in some ways actually, it's maybe better for me to describe what the picture will be look, look like when you open the PDF. Um, so, right, here's our, here's, here's the out, one way of representing the output of CHAMP for that karate club and this iterative parameter space mapping. Um, the one community solution is bad. We ignore it. Um, if you go look at Mark's formula, it doesn't actually map to anything because it's degenerate, right? There is no, there is no theta out to compute anything because there are, there are no pairs of nodes that aren't in the same community. So nothing happens with the one community solutions. Um, what is supposed to be here is a single arrow that points from the middle of this two community uh, this little line segment. So this line segment is saying that there is a single two community solution whose domain of optimality runs from this value of gamma to that value of gamma. And there's a single three community solution whose domain of optimality, by that I mean it has the highest Q of any of the partitions that Champ saw um, from this value to this value, when you get to the four community, it's sort of interesting. There are three X's and two colors. It's because there's one four community solution here and a different four community solution there. And then what is supposed to be on this diagram for you is an arrow that goes from here to here. And so that's that, okay, yeah, there is a two community solution. It's optimum. But it's gamma it actually is associated with in Newman's iterative map in his equivalence with with stochastic block models is actually at this value of gamma. So it's not a fixed point of the map. It points to the three community solution. And so then once you're at the three community solution, it actually points to the four community solution. And this four community solution points. So, and then everything, this is like terrible without the arrows to show you. They're just gray arrows. I don't know why they're not on the plot. Um, all of these flow downhill in the same way. And so it's kind of a beautiful singling out of this one four community solution that you should draw your eye to. Okay, so I want to then, with the last couple minutes that I've got, um, I want to show you some things actually that there's code and that there's code that's uploaded with some, uh, with some demos that you can play with. Um, again, do not hesitate to contact me. You can coordinates there. Um, if you want to run some very old MATLAB multi-layer modularity code, it's there. Um, these methods in Python are there. Bleeding edge um, attempts to do this in R are now finally in this notebook. Um, it needs to be said, even though I'm, I'm uh, you know, I need to keep this moving fast. Of course, none of this happens without the work of super talented grad students and postdocs and undergrads actually. Um, so CHAMP was developed by William Ware. Uh, he was an MD, PhD student in bioinformatics at, um, at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Scott Emmons and Ryan Gibson were both undergrads working with me at, at Chapel Hill. Dane Taylor was a postdoc. He's now faculty at Buffalo. Um, Ryan was then the one who did this whole combining of um, the iterative parameter space map into CHAMP. That's a paper that just came out last fall. And the implementation that 
we're going to show you here was all thanks to three Dartmouth undergrads, uh, Rachel, Matthew, Ryan, Rebney, and Ava Sharps, uh, Sharpstein. Um, so let me just show you the quick pictures because what do I, what do I got? I've got like eight minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so let me just show you the quick pictures here. So, all right. Um, there's, a few, there's a few things you got to do. I'm really glad I'm not doing this live. Although, really, the truth is, the hitting run hold notebook, I mean, it's just done in like no time. It's just a great feeling. Um, so, we're going to do all of this in iGraph. Um, this will all get pulled into IdeaNet in the proper way. We're just going to load a whole bunch of stuff tidyverse, ggplot stuff. The really important thing here. Uh, that is maybe not as big of a deal now as it was the last couple times we did this, is that for what we're going to do today, you absolutely have to be running an iGraph no earlier than 127. Um, but that's like a year and a half ago now, so hopefully you are. This is 142. It's because starting in 127, Vincent Trog put his Leiden algorithm implementation into the main iGraph um, uh, library. What we're going to do, you do not need to look at any of these functions. Um, they're all sitting down in a subdirectory called champ map scripts. We're just showing you what nine R files happen to be under there. Six of them do things. Three of them are just wrappers to do those things. Um, and so we're just going to source them all in here so that you have access to them. But you, we're going to show you you only need to do three things. Um, and everything we're going to do is built on cluster Leiden because it is the single most robust method inside of the iGraph package for varying the resolution parameter um, in my experience. There's a lot more text in here you can read about. You can keep seeing my jokes about Eric Kalachik. So we can pull in the Karate Club data. And so, right, here's just another visualization of the Karate Club network. If your method doesn't work on this, go home. And so what are we going to do? So there's going to be three steps. Right? What have we laid out for you in this whole talk? What do we need to do? We need to get our bag of marbles. Right? We need to generate a bunch of partitions to be interested in. That's going to be step one. Step two, we're going to run CHAMP. And then as long as it's an unweighted network, I didn't say that before, but really strictly speaking, the th all that theory from Mark Newman only works for unweighted networks because of this equivalence with, a, with an unweighted stochastic block model. So, you, you know, all bets are off if you try to do something with weighted data. Yeah. Well, he didn't, nobody's done the theory for that to connect to it or not. Um, all the formulae make sense, and so I think you could pass weighted data into step three, the iterative parameter space map, but I just hesitate to endorse it because you're then, you've lost the disconnection to the theory. I think it might still be interesting in some cases. Um, okay, so we're just going to collect a bunch of partitions. I'm showing you the inputs for the get partitions wrapper. All it's going to do is run cluster Leiden many times. The default is 100 times. You know, um, at one point in the iterative mapping paper that just appeared last fall, there's a spot where we have plots for what happens on the Karate Club if you run it a million times. You're like, why? Because it took less than five minutes. So, you know, it's just not. It's not a computationally intense thing. Um, we ran it 100 times. It tells you we, that you've got 13 unique partitions that were identified running it 100 times. Oh, and I should have said running it at 100 times in a, in a range of gamma that was, that was there. Um, OK, so that was, that was function one. Function two is just called champ. So you just feed it your network and the partitions that you got from step one. and it says that eight of those 13 partitions are in what we sometimes call the champ set, the set that actually lives on the upper envelope. And it makes this pretty little GG, that little GG plot for you. Um, super kudos to Ava Sharfstein for making these things prettier um, and, for Rachel, and to Rachel Matthew in particular for fixing a lot of bugs, um, particularly in the multi-layer implementation that we're trying to do. That was weighted, so I'm just going to quickly redo it for unweighted. Um, so we're just going to do steps one and two again, right? Again, all we're going to do, generate a bunch of partitions. This time, we're doing it on the unweighted data. We're going to get 16 of them. We're going to run champ. We're going to save it in partition summary. This is quirky in the current implementation. I want to get rid of this, but just to warn you, yes, we're doing this in an unweighted network, but the way that we currently have it coded to properly handle an unweighted network is to make it a weighted network with all the edges with edge weight one. 
it, it, it works. <laughs> you know, we'll fix it eventually. This is not even alpha level code at this point, right? Um, I guarantee you that the good developing people at IdeaNet will not absorb any of this into their library until it works better than this. So those were steps one and two again. We get a similar but different picture, right? Because it's now unweighted. It's not using the weights in any way. But again, every one of these lines is one of the unique solutions that was found and only these I lost count. Was it eight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of them are everywhere on the upper envelope. You're quickly saying, wait, why are they numbered 10 and 12? It's because it's not numbering just the ones that are on the upper envelope. It's numbering all the unique ones that were identified, some of which are not there. And then the last big win is that, um, and we get a lot of cool updates on this, is that, yes, the gray arrows are here now. Okay, so now you can see the gray arrows I was trying to tell you about. They show up now, good. Um, so now, right, this is just, this is the third function that you need to know about, which is just called get champ map, because it's an iterative map on the champ set. So what you have to do is give it your network, the partitions you had found, this collection called partition summary that tells you all about the champ set and all of its wonderful properties, and you get out this wonderful answer. And so, right, you can read off the picture. What it's saying is the two community solution is pointing at the three community solution, which is pointing at one of the four community solutions, which is pointing at itself, and the other four community solution is pointing at it, and these higher numbers of community solutions are all just pointing down the hill, and they all meet in the center and tell you that's a really special answer. Now, that happened to be the answer we got when we just did you know, the, the, the typical user thing, it was at a gamma of one. But if Jim will let me, um, I, will, I will just scroll, right? now we just do the same thing for football, right? You get, you get pictures, for the, the, the little pieces of code are right there, they're exactly the same three calls with a couple of variants of running um, some, different, um, uh, some different choices of how many runs we do. And now, right, you get a very, you, it's qualitatively similar, in the sense that if you start with gamma really small, right, it kind of works up the hill. And if you start with gamma really big, it works down the hill. But note that it stopped somewhere very different than the default, which would have been one, which would have given you an answer somewhere near here, which would have been very, very sensitive to stochastic fluctuations and instead picks out this 12 community partition. And I keep lying and saying one more thing, uh, saying that there's going to be one more thing. So just to show you that it gets like that it can work on you know better data that down in this same notebook for y'all is um, doing this on this famous 2004 political blogs example. And so you can read it in. I think I think I ran. I forget now. It says up here. Yeah. So I did a thousand runs over a gamma range from zero to five. Um, all, of the, all of the parameters that, that are possible on these wrappers are, are commented the first time they're used up at the top. You can see this is a highly unstable um, setting. I run it a, a thousand times, I get 813 different answers. Whew. Supposed to wrap my head around 813 answers and do something useful with it? Okay, so I run it through CHAMP. Okay, 43 is a lot better than 813, but that's still a lot to deal with. And so, right, then you go to the maybe art, not math version of it, and you look at the champ picture that got drawn, right? So there are 43 different line segments making up this upper envelope. Uh, I don't know. Are any of them, you know, more special than others? I mean, okay, there's a couple big ones out here. Maybe I'd grab those. Um, if I hadn't made my numbers so big, you might notice that some of these are sort of non-trivially big ranges. Maybe there's three of them there or four of them there. This is a little bit of an art um, to, to sort of focus your attention. So let's run the, the it, Newman's iterative map on it. And when we do, we find that only two of them are fixed points of the map. There's a whole bunch of stuff down here running uphill. There's a whole bunch of stuff here running downhill. They meet in the middle at a seven community solution, which you're thinking, why are there seven distinct communities in a political blogs network around an election? Hold that thought. 
This seems to be running downhill. It's stopping right here on the edge of a domain of optimality. This makes me a little nervous because maybe if I found another solution that would tweak this, this might not always show up exactly here. In fact, I set the random seed for a reason, which is because if you set it differently, sometimes it stops here, sometimes it stops here, sometimes it stops here, sometimes it flows all the way through. So this is to say you still have to try some things that are random, but my last, and this time, Jim, I promise I really mean last. My last observation is those seven communities. So right now, I'm really only paying attention to two partitions. We ran it a 1,000 times. We had 813 different answers. Even after running CHAMP, what did we have? Was it 43, something like that? We had 40-some answers. Now I'm down to just two few, right? So now I can look at those two. And I can go, well, I have no idea why I'm getting seven communities in a political blogs network going into a presidential election. Ah, this is why I'm getting seven communities. I really only have two, which was what you expected, right? Um, I'm, I'm really only getting two and then a bunch of small things. And is that other one interesting? I don't know. Um, moreover, um, are they left-leaning or right-leaning? You can do a table. There's a value parameter in this data of are they left-leaning or right-leaning. Your table basically shows, yeah, the communities are basically left-leaning and right-leaning. And maybe very tongue-in-cheek after taking an hour of your time, um, I should say that, well, yeah, duh, it's pretty obvious I have two big groups in this data set. Because if you just run a force-directed layout on it, um, this, is why, this is one of the force-directed layouts that comes out. So obviously, they're on an ideological spectrum um, at the two ends. So I don't know. Did you learn anything from this final example that you wouldn't have known? Maybe that's the cautionary tale that goes in there, too. Um, there's a joke about how no one died in this cautionary tale that if you're really paying attention to the pop culture references, you will get. And if not, you're just looking at me blankly. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate it. And with that, I just thank you for your time. And I really stress, if you want to use any of these tools, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. We want to see them used. That's why we're building them into R. We would love to help you work with your data. Lots of concerns. <laughs> Exhaustion. On the schedule, we're listed for doing um, uh, a general open Q&A session as well. So we're, we can transfer to that, or rather, um, or we can take a break and move on to the activities. So yes. Please. Uh, so I, I have actually seen in that mentioned specifically um, with regards to finding communities and multiplex networks. Um, how does that exact, like, can you speak to that at all? Is that what you're running today as an in info net, or is that something separate? So every, so the question is basically where is InfoMap in this and what are the details with running InfoMap in this? So InfoMap is awesome. It is not really the, the you, and you could use InfoMap, you could call cluster InfoMap to your heart's content and feed it into CHAMP and into this parameter space mapping. If you do, be aware that InfoMap is solving a different optimization problem. It is not a modularity based optimization. It might be modularity adjacent if you look at it through the right lens, but it's different. It is a different goal. And so you still might find really interesting things by doing it. Um, I will admit I have, I have a little bit of a philosophical difference with Martin and his, Martin Rossfall and his colleagues um, who develop InfoMap. I insist they actually have something akin to, an inf to a resolution parameter in their, formula, in their formulation that they've effectively just set to one. Um, and without, you know, it, it's a beautiful information theoretic um, mechanism. Um, the reason I make this claim, for those of you who care, if you're down in the weeds and are interested, um, uh, one of the same undergrads who was involved in some of this work, Scott Emmons, has a beautiful paper about doing clustering, uh, generalizing InfoMap to a situation where you also want to include node attributes as part of the information that's being used in the code book that InfoMap is building. And when you do that, you have to introduce a parameter that effectively relates to what's the, what's the information cost per using the channel that feeds you information about the node attribute 
versus the one that feeds you information about the two different kinds of information being used in the network attribute. But note there's already two in kinds of information in this channel and only one kind of information in this channel. So why can't I break the original InfoMap channel into two and pay a variable cost on the two pieces of it? Um, that's heretical to, to the InfoMap people though, so that might just be my personal opinion. Well, so right, and so then if, you, and if you're doing it in, an, in a multi-layer setting, you're also, it's the same thing. They're introducing a parameter there too, right, that is, so the question is, well, wait a minute, what about in a multiplex or a multi-layer setting? Right, the same thing happens. There's an additional parameter introduced, and so, so, but I'm still insistent that there's a spot where they're shoving two pieces of information through one information channel that they could break into two different channels and pay different costs for it, just like you pay a different cost for the multi-layer edges, just like you pay for the network attribute information. So there is something there that I think could be generalized. There's nothing wrong with taking InfoMap solutions and shoving them through CHAMP and shoving them through this parameter space map, because again, CHAMP and the parameter space map are just post-processors, but you should do so knowing that you're deliberately post-processing with a different objective function than the one that InfoMap was trying to solve. I hope that answered the question. If not, we can keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.